Okay, we are in chapter 18, and we're going to discuss the second half of chapter 18, which refers to the monitoring devices that um, pertain to advanced EMS uh, practice. We will come back uh, at a uh, later date, a different week, and cover the first half of this chapter. Uh, so we will be, if you're following along in the textbook, I am starting on page 468 uh, at the top of the second column where it says monitoring devices. Um, <clears throat> so there's a number of diagnostic pieces of equipment uh, that we use in EMS. Obviously, depending on your level, will uh, indicate how, how and what you use. Uh, but a number of these are either not something you've been able to do in the past or maybe something you're just not completely familiar with. And uh, as things have gradually changed, uh, perhaps your service does, does not take um, an opportunity to use these. But. So we'll move forward now with the rest of this chapter. So our advanced EMT education standard discusses applies scene information to patient assessment findings, including the scene size up, primary and secondary assessments, patient history, and reassessment to guide emergency management. The objectives that we'll cover, um, I've taken a few of these out obviously that pertain to vital signs. So uh, you can find these as far as defining key terms and then explain pulse oximetry, capnography, glucometry, and we will just barely briefly touch on ECG monitoring. Um, while it's not something that you can interpret, it's something that you may be involved with obtaining uh, and possibly transmitting uh, to definitive care. All right, so in an introduction, our monitoring devices that we would typically discuss um, would be electronic vital sign monitoring, pulse oximetry, capnography, electrocardiogram or ECG monitoring, and blood glucose level determination. And we'll also be trying to interpret those eventually when we start to recap vital signs and assessment. We'll be interpreting uh, and uh, integrating uh, those into our overall impression of the patient. All right, we're skipping that because that goes with your case study. So, so to integrate vital signs monitoring devices into the assessment process, <clears throat> it's going to require some teamwork. Can you do all these things by yourself? Sure, absolutely you can. You certainly can um, run around and get all these things. But if you have the extra hands that can assist you, why not put them to work? It's kind of like trying to do the assessment all by yourself. Sure, you can do it, but you're not going to be nearly as, as efficient when you're doing it all by yourself. Whereas if you have a team of at least one other EMS professional, somebody can be doing uh, vital signs and whatnot if, if the... Uh, you know, if your EMT partner uh, is uh, allowed to do glucometry, uh, they certainly could uh, do that and incorporate that uh, into uh, the practice. Um, EMTs in the state of Iowa, EMTBs could do glucometry. EMTs in the state of Iowa require uh, extra training and medical director approval. So um, not all EMTs may be able to do this if they don't have the appropriate approvals. So some of these things, such as capnometry, um, capnometry or capnography, um, which isn't specifically addressed in many cases, may or may not fall within uh, the scope of, uh, of an AEMT or an EMT to do. Um, there tends to be more of a push to see capnometry at more levels, so this may become a more uh, widespread practice. Of course, you need to obtain a full set of baseline vital signs. That really takes a little bit of time for somebody to do. It's beyond, uh, you know, your just quick, quick look assessment. Uh, and then you got to prioritize your tasks uh, in relation to the patient's condition. So sometimes we have to really start to think about: Is it necessary that we get everything right away, or do we need to start transport, go back and get some other things? Um, certain things were, are going to um, rise to the top quicker than others. So let's say we're we're able to do all of these these skills that I previously mentioned. <clears throat> we have a patient who has uh, a, an alert and an oriented mental status, 
yet is really struggling to breathe, we may choose to uh, get capnometry very early in the process. Whereas if we have an altered mental status, obviously glucometry is going to be uh, very big in there. Pulse oximetry is, is something that we've previously downplayed quite a bit um, and, and have been really pushed people away from relying on it solely. And now we're really starting to warm up to it and say, when done correctly, it can be a very useful diagnostic tool. Obviously, you need to communicate with your team members. If, if you have a partner that you've worked all the time with, a lot of times you really become reliant on your partner. So if your partner goes on vacation, you have a new partner, um, yet new partner doesn't anticipate the needs like your, your regular partner does. So, And I've been in this situation which I had EMT partners or, or even paramedic partners that uh, I, I didn't ever have to say a word. They were on top of it. They knew what I was going to call for next. And, uh, and that's fantastic. But we've got to remember as, as things change, we've got to remember to communicate. This is nothing new. Uh, reassessment of the patient's vital signs and really their primary assessment, in fact, in any of their specific um, treatments that we've performed and, and uh, anything that we've um, identified as major issues. We reassess every five minutes on critical, 15 minutes on non-critical. So you should be assessing vital signs before and after giving medication. I know that this really is more of a vital signs discussion here, but having just discussed medication administration, um, it, I think it's poignant and pertinent that we have it in here that vital signs need to be obtained even more often the more advanced techniques we're employing. So if the patient has changes in complaints, changes in the level of distress, or their uh, condition worsens, it, it gets more vital signs. Just because we say 5 and 15 minutes doesn't mean that we can't do it sooner than that. So <clears throat> additionally, uh, when you're doing vital signs, you may also be needing to do some reassessment uh, with some of your diagnostic tools. So the assessment of vital signs is integrated into patient assessment in different ways depending on the patient's condition and resources. And then what patient situational factors influence when vital signs should be taken in the patient assessment process. Like I just mentioned on a previous slide, when we start to see patients change in complaint, overall changes in condition, when we've given recent um, uh, treatments and medications, um, all those sorts of things would drive us to an additional set. Okay, so to move more formally into monitoring devices, I actually want to stop for just a moment and look at this device that you um, uh, that's on the screen here. This device is actually more than a pulse oximeter. Um, this one is a uh, carbon monoxide monitor as well, where it can where it can measure carboxyhemoglobin. This is a device uh, made by the Masimo Corporation. I think that the specific model number on this is the RAD57, RAD57. Um, the RAD57 is capable of doing not only pulse oximetry, which they're using it for here, you can also switch it into a different mode that will help you monitor the met hemoglobin and uh, the carboxyhemoglobin levels in the blood. So when we have the uh, uh, patients that have been exposed either to carbon monoxide, intentionally or unintentionally, or other toxic gases, um, say we're in a setting, say like a, a house fire, uh, there's that risk for carbon monoxide poisoning. And it, it may be uh, very beneficial to have one of those. The problem with this is, number one, um, there's been some scientific debate whether or not it's truly as effective and truly as uh, accurate as, as they're claiming. And secondly, this device is very expensive. Uh, I believe the last time I priced it out, it was somewhere in the six to seven thousand dollar range for something that you use extremely extremely rarely so you're not going to do it a lot you're not going to check a lot of uh, carbon monoxides but uh, so that's just something to, to consider I mean there's always going to be cool fun tools out there you have to really look at it from a broad perspective and say okay this is neat this is cool should we do this number one how accurate is it number two does it fall well I guess before that so 0 0.5 before we even say 
how accurate is it is it within our scope of practice um, it may not be in your scope of practice so it's something that you would need to find out right off the bat is it accurate and what is our risk versus benefit so if we go and drop six seven eight thousand dollars on a cool little machine like this is it going to get used or is it going to sit on the shelf you know in a case like this where you have uh, a device in which it works also as a pulse oximeter, eh, you might be able to swing that a little bit easier because it, it's dual purpose. Uh, although I will tell you that for you know a, a, a fairly decent field usable pulse oximeter, you can get one for about 300 bucks. So you know 6,000 versus 300, yeah, somewhere you got to draw a line. But maybe you got money burning a hole in your pocket and you need it. So in that's the case. That's a a decision that that uh, that your service has to make. All right, so pulse oximetry. Um, those of you guys are probably almost all of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, pulse oximetry uses light. It's actually two different beams of light. It's uh, it's red and infrared light that it uh, bounces through your fingers. It sends it through your finger from the light emitting diode, the LED, uh, over to the other side where there should be a little sensor, a little window that looks uh, looks kind of like the, the other side but just doesn't light up. And uh, the amount of that light in, uh, in those two waveforms that make it through helps to determine how much of the hemoglobin is saturated. And when we say saturated means there is oxygen full attached to all of the heme groups available. And uh, well, I shouldn't specifically say oxygen because in most cases it's oxygen, and that's what we're hoping it is. But um, going back to our carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide attaches to blood 200 times faster than oxygen does. So, with that being said, the patients that we have that are short of breath, headaches, feeling nauseated, um, we may slap, you know cherry pink red skin on them, and uh, you know everybody in the house is sick. We go and we slap a pulse oximeter on them, and it's like, oh, well, everybody's 99, 100%. We're good to go. Well, the thing about pulse oximetry is it cannot differentiate between carbon monoxide and oxygen. So it's still going to say 100%. It's just not 100% oxygen because all of it's saturated with something. So that saturated hemoglobin turns the blood a brighter red color and desaturated hemoglobin a darker red color. So if you get an opportunity in the hospital when you're doing some clinical time, if they're going to draw ABGs, ABGs is arterial blood gases, usually they'll do these on short, shortness of breath patients or people who, and some people who are unresponsive or altered mental status. But if they do ABGs, pay close attention to the color of the blood that comes out when they draw ABGs because that ABG is using a needle poking it through the wall of an artery, which hurts, by the way, and drawing blood directly out of an artery. Remember, arteries carry typically oxygenated blood away from the heart. Veins carry deoxygenated blood to the heart in most cases. IV intravenous, or intravenous um, is in the vein. ABGs, or an IA, uh, is intraarterial or um, arterial blood gas where you're actually accessing blood from. Um, you're, you're getting the good stuff, the fresh stuff, as opposed to the old stuff that's in the veins. So take a look and compare. Hopefully maybe they'll draw blood not only arterially but venously on the same patient. You can see a, a very noticeable difference. Um, it, it's not as easy to, to go from patient to patient to patient and compare because things, things are going to be different. But uh, to see them will both come from the same patient relatively same time, uh, it, it's pretty uh, impressive difference. So light sources are placed on one side of the capillary bed. Usually that's the finger or the earlobe. There are other sensors that you can get. You can put sensors uh, on the nose. Um, usually your finger probe will also work on the toes. Um, you got to look at you know, circulation of the lower extremities and whatnot. But uh, And then there's also some that I've seen that you kind of put um, above and off to the side or up, uh, you know, superior and laterally to the eye, uh, kind of above your eyebrow, just above the, the outside corner of your eyebrow basically. 
um, that they'll put them up there and I'm not exactly sure how how well that one works but I have seen it before so if you're looking for a place in which you can you can uh, scan the capillary beds and that's how that sensor system works so it's going to give us a saturation of a percentage of O2 um, and this is going to display also a pulse rate so if we're looking at well we'll look at the rad 57 uh, on uh, page 468 um, down there in 1812 figure 1812 it's showing us in the red number 95 percent saturation and the green number is the pulse or 59 so our goal is to keep the patient 95 or better um, and then if it's not we may have to consider supplemental oxygen or even ventilating the patient now SPO2 you're going to see as we go through this class you're going to start to see more and more references to certain types of gases so SPO2 is one that we should all know FiO2 is another one that you probably know but maybe haven't really thought twice about the FiO2 is fraction of inspired O2 fraction of inspired oxygen um, and in we'll take room air for example room air FiO2 big F little I big O and then sub 2 um, but the FiO2 of room air is we'll round it 21 percent um, because it's actually slightly less than that but 21 percent FiO2 at room air when we put a person on a non rebreather and we crank that baby up to 15 liters per minute we get a good mask seal uh, we have it, you know, snugged and fit up correctly for our patient. A lot of times we can expect to have a 90-95% FiO2 uh, for that patient because we're drawing oxygen directly from the bottle. The bottle goes, or the air, go, oxygen goes into the bag, and that's where the next breath of air comes from. And with everything going correctly, they only draw that air from the bag or the oxygen from the bag. So uh, you probably are going to have a little bit of leakage here and there, and that's going to create you know that gap between that 100% and that 90 to 95 so that's FiO2 the amount of oxygen presented to the patient we have SpO2 this is the saturation percentage of oxygen so how much of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen um, we may also talk about uh, SaO2 and this is the saturation of arterial oxygen or arterial saturation of oxygen that's what you get when you draw a blood gas so is an SAO2 uh, so we're going to start to see a few more of those so pay attention when you start to see these SPO2 means saturation via the pulse oximeter so readings obviously can be affected by high intensity ambient light so if you're in a very bright area you may not get a good reading if you have every light on in the back of the truck and you have very reflective white uh, walls and whatnot it's very possible that that could affect it so dimming the lights a little bit might give you a better uh, reading sometimes uh, fluorescent lights tend to cause a little bit more interference there poor circulation that's the number one thing that usually is a big problem for us uh, they don't have good circulation uh, whether they have a degenerative process or they've had severe uh, atherosclerosis and arterial sclerosis where the, ar the arteries are narrowed maybe they have very low cardiac output or they're in shock we may not get a decent reading at all most pulse oximeters will have um, a couple of, of additional items on them one is referred to as um, the pleth wave and a pleth wave uh, can be if you look on page uh, 469 in the second picture there you see kind of a waveform that's actually a capno waveform um, but it's more or less a pleth wave and you can get pulse oximeters that actually will graph that out for you um, it, and it's much faster than that because obviously the heart rate is two to three times faster than most respiratory rates or even four but uh, so you can get these and they're more like spikes as opposed to plateaus like that but you can get those but most of the time our pulse oximeters just actually have either a little meter that goes up and down and if you look at the 
back on that Rad 57 picture uh, in figure 1812 there, you can see the little gauges off to the side. Um, it kind of goes, you can see it goes up and down. So it's not lit up right now, but um, it'll tell you how, you know, your, your uh, quality of pulse you're getting there. And the most common thing we see on pulse oximeters, particularly the little finger probe ones, uh, or the little, uh, like called the, what they call the non-anonics, which is just the whole unit just clipped right on the finger. It's not got a wire or anything. It's got a little lanyard. But those, as well as a lot of our other smaller handheld versions, uh, will have, simply have a light on them. And it will be a green light, yellow light, red light. Green light means you're getting very good readings. Um, it's able to easily pick that up. Yellow light is eh, questionable. We're not sure how good of a pulse this is. And then obviously red light, is, this is terrible. And in most cases, if you have a red light, you're not getting a, a number. You're probably not getting a reading. So with poor circulation, person's cold, uh, has various medical conditions, uh, that can, minor, that can uh, uh, cause issues with getting a good pulse oximeter reading. The other thing is uh, things that interfere with the light source passing through a tissue, through the tissues to the sensor. Red and variations of red nail polish as well as certain nail accoutrements uh, or uh, you know, layers of stuff they put on people's nails can be uh, another hindrance to getting a decent light, a uh, decent uh, uh, reading. So if you have a person that has you know, browns, purples, reds, uh, pinks, uh, those can interfere with that red light that's trying to, to go through there because remember the reason why we see the color red is because that's the color that's reflected by that item. So it absorbs the other colors, it reflects the one color. So if it's reflecting red light and we're trying to use red light, that makes some sense there as why it may, maybe it's not working quite as well. <clears throat> All right, so once we've completed uh, you know kind of chatting about O2 there, um, one thing that I, I guess I'll bring to your attention is if you look at 469 in your text, the very top paragraph there uh, under the blue, uh, the, the blue and yellow in the field box there, um, it talks about levels of hypoxia. And uh, a normal pulse oximeter reading obviously is 95 to 99. Uh, in higher ge or lower geographic elevations, readings of 91 to 94 uh, can indicate mild hypoxia. Readings of 86 to 90, moderate hypoxia, less than 85, severe hypoxia. Um, generally, they consider any pulse oximetry reading below 85, you really can't take much stock in that, what, it, what the pulse oximetry actually is. So if it's under 85, I mean, you're still going to document it, but understand that it may be 25. But it's just not as, as specific when it gets uh, below 85. So in most cases where we're talking, if the patient has a pulse oximetry reading above 94, uh, we're probably not going to apply oxygen to them uh, unless we have other reasons to believe so. And remember, we treat the patient, not their monitor. So if we've got this patient that's really struggling to breathe, but their pulse oximetry is great, probably in their best interest to continue to put some oxygen on this person. If you have uh, a reading, say, from about 90 to 94, 91 to 94, you may want to consider a, a nasal cannula. Anything below 90, you should probably consider at least a, a non-rebreather. Um, or if you do trial them on a nasal cannula, you don't let them sit there for too long. You want, you're going to want to see um, improvements very quickly. Now, back to that in the field box up at the top there. Uh, in higher elevations, lower SpO2 readings are considered satisfactory. Uh, for example, at 5,000 feet, roughly Denver, an SpO2 of roughly 90% or higher is acceptable. Um, there's much less air pressure up there, therefore oxygen doesn't transfer quite as easily. Um, and uh, so a lot of times people actually will build more red blood cells uh, and have more hemoglobin in order to transport and have more oxygen in the system. This is part of the reason why athletes train in higher elevations is their they're acclimating their body. They're making their body build more red cells and, and therefore can have uh, a better oxygen supply. And uh, so when they train in the mountains, they build up all these extra red cells. 
then they go back down to wherever they're going to compete at, they kind of have an advantage. Uh, it's kind of, uh, it's not technically blood doping, but it's the, it's the same concept that occurs when somebody does blood dope or they, they will get a transfusion of blood that will help them uh, maintain uh, higher oxygen levels. So, all right, so this monitoring device that we're looking at here is a carbon dioxide detector. I want to take a moment and say carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide while very similar sounding and a very similar abbreviation, the carbon monoxide is CO, capital C, capital O, or actually, um, yeah, capital C, capital O, and it is a byproduct of the combustion of fossil fuels and carbon gas, or carbon-based um, fuels. Carbon dioxide, cap capital C, capital O, 2, sub 2 on that, uh, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of animal respiration. So um, when we have animals that are breathing in oxygen, the waste product ends up being carbon dioxide. Um, if you don't remember back from uh, elementary school science, um, animals breathe in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide, and plants breathe in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. So um, just a, another quick little cool fact. But uh, So carbon dioxide, the way that this uh, system that you're actually looking at here is this guy is actually on a nasal cannula, and he's getting oxygen. And then there, the way that this one is set up, there is a separate tube, and you can kind of, well, you can't really see very well, but um, one side of the, the nasal cannula uh, tubing that's split and goes over his ears, one side is carrying oxygen to the cannula portion. The other side is actually a, a uh, sensor line from that little prong that sticks down in front of his mouth, and it will carry that exhaled air through that tube into the, the machine and sense it. So it's actually got two little adapters on the end. One you plug on the oxygen bottle, the other you plug into the carbon dioxide or entitled carbon dioxide monitor. Um, and this can be done on spontaneously breathing patients. Usually it's for people with either altered mental status or severe difficulty in breathing. So entitled carbon dioxide, the way that we typically will abbreviate this is capital E, little t, capital C, capital O, sub 2, so ETCO2, um, so ETCO2, and tidal CO2. Um, we have exhaled carbon dioxide monitoring, or capnometry, measures the amount of carbon dioxide in exhaled air. So uh, this is monitoring how much comes out. We have capnography, which is a display of measurements of exhaled carbon dioxide monitoring. So we can get a graph off of this um, and uh, see the amounts that are, uh, are being exhaled. Look on page 469 in the text and you can see the capnogram in that second picture there, 1814, and that waveform, that uh, pleth wave like I talked about, uh, that is the uh, exhaled carbon dioxide. When it's down at the base, when it's down at the baseline, uh, they are inhaling. When they're inhaling, there is no CO2 being detected because air is coming in, not being blown out. There may be minuscule micro amounts of CO2, but uh, it's not going to be detected because the airflow is away from the sensor as opposed to aimed at the sensor. When they start to exhale, you see it spike up sharply because it goes upward. And then as their lungs are finishing up, um, because you don't just inhale and done. It's not like a split second to be inhaled. It's inhaled and then kind of a gradual uh, end of your inhalation. And that gradual little, uh, when you kind of exhale, it's just kind of that last little, <sighs> when you kind of push out the last bits. And that's the, the, the right side or the kind of gradual upslope that you get on the plateau there. And then next thing you know, you're taking another uh, breath in, and it drops back down to the baseline. 
So that shows us in title CO2. Um, and we have a, a number, um, if we look to the left of that pleth wave, you have a 14 RR, that means their respiratory rate is 14. That's a very accurate um, way to detect it. Um, there are other types of monitors that will watch respiration, but it's all based off of how much their chest moves. So it's not quite as accurate. This time, every time you exhale out, it, it's picking up that air. And it says millimeters of mercury 32. That millimeters of mercury 32 is the normal reading uh, or the reading for the end tidal CO2. Um, I'll draw your attention, flip the page to 470. That first full sentence um, that you see there, the normal range of end tidal carbon dioxide or ETCO2 uh, is in exhaled air is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury which corresponds to the PCO2 of a um, arterial blood gas of 38 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So when we do it in a blood gas, it's almost identical to the same way that we do it from exhaled air. You're probably going to want to highlight what the, uh, uh, the norm is there for ETCO, 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. The capnogram is a display uh, waveform that represents that. So we've, we've got that capnogram um, as uh, evidence there uh, on 469. And then here it is again. The end tidal CO2 normal range of carbon dioxide in exhaled air, 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. We have the PCO2 and we have PO2 when we're doing blood gases, um, but PCO2 and PO2. These are the partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Um, and the norm for an ABG is 38 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So a person who is breathing very quickly and very heavily, um, we'll say somebody who has Kussmaul's respiration, you're going to have to exercise your brain for a minute maybe, Kussmaul's respiration, very deep, very fast very typical of people who are acidotic and the most common person that becomes acidotic and uses small respiration is the diabetic ketoacidosis patient. Diabetic ketoacidosis is an acidosis of the body caused by uh, metabolic causes because he, the diabetic has super high blood sugar but no insulin to use it. So the body starts to burn itself up creating ketones which is a waste product and ends up uh, building up in the system. So somebody with end tidal CO2 that is very low, let's, let's say they have an end tidal CO2 of uh, 25, and they have Kussmaul's respiration, um, obviously they're doing a fine job getting rid of the extra CO2, um, and they may or, or may not be actually compensating for that extra amounts of acid built up. So somebody who's retaining a lot of CO2, We'll say for somebody maybe a narcotic overdose, where narcotic overdoses, one of the typical things we see with narcotic overdoses is slow, shallow respirations. So they're not blowing off the CO2 that their body's creating. Maybe they would have an end tidal CO2 of 50 or 55 or even higher. Um, there are some issues that we have to take into consideration here. They have to be circulating in order for us to have a decent end tidal CO2. Because if they're not circulating blood, CO2 does not get returned to the lungs, therefore they don't exhale it. So there will be a minuscule amount that's actually given off by the alveoli themselves, but it's not reflective of what the whole body is doing. So in cardiac arrest, when we're doing end tidal CO2, we don't often have very high and tidal CO2s because there's no blood really moving. Now, we can use end tidal CO2 if on intubated patients uh, that the paramedics or doctors or nurses have intubated. Um, there's not been enough significant data or studies to correlate it to uh, King Airways or Combitubes yet, although they believe that it's going to be very close to the same uh, sort of data. Uh, so they're, they're, they're saying it's okay to try it, but it's not 100% um, yet. They just haven't, uh, they don't have enough data. 
So when we're working a cardiac arrest patient, we have an end tidal CO2 on them. For the non-breathing patient, uh, we may, we're looking to try to get end tidal CO2s of a 10 to 15 is usually uh, showing that we have efficient CPR and ventilation. So 10 to 15, while much lower than we would expect norm, uh, it's at least showing us something's happening. And remember, chest compression, CPR, is only a third of a, as effective as the patient's heart normally beating. So with that being said, that's roughly a third, 10 to 15 is roughly a third of what we would expect on a normal patient. So interesting. One other interesting thing that happens with end tidal CO2 and cardiac arrest patients is once in a while while we're doing CPR and we'll all of a sudden see their end tidal CO2 spike up and it'll spike up to 50 or 60 or in the high 40s. Um, and it spikes way up above that 10 to 15 that we're used to seeing. That is often seen as a preliminary sign that return of spontaneous circulation is going to occur. So, or they have started to, uh, their heart is starting to pump a little bit on its own. So if you see those spikes in end tidal CO2, um, pay very close attention. And when you get to the end of your cycle of 30 compressions, uh, or actually when you get to the end of your two minute cycle, so your five cycles uh, of CPR and breath. So when you're at the end of your two minute cycle, then obviously take a moment and check the pulse uh, and check the monitor. There may be, if you have the capability to see it, you very well could have a return of pulse. So interesting to, to note. This is referred to as a color metric end tidal carbon dioxide detector device. Wow, that sounds cool. But what this really is, is a piece of litmus paper. Anybody who's taken chemistry before probably has used litmus paper. You maybe even did this in junior high or middle school. Litmus paper tells you whether you have an acid or a base. You dip it in this kind of tan colored paper. You dip it into um, your solution and it'll tell you acid or base. It turns red or it turns blue. This is really the same thing. Um, a little modified, but what this device does, uh, when you take it out of the package, it's usually the color right around the left side of B there. So that just very basic tan color. Um, as a patient inhales and then exhales, um, you may see it switch from purple to yellow, to purple, to yellow, to purple, to yellow. And this is telling us that we've got highly oxygenated stuff going in, carbon, and not, carbon dioxide stuff going out. So um, yellow is yes. If you see it change to yellow, then yes, you're, you're getting good CO2. If, it's, if you see it kind of cycle a little bit between darker and lighter tans, they tell you to think about it uh, because you maybe are not getting a good reading here. And if it remains purple the entire time, then you're probably going to need to pull it because you're not getting CO2 to flow. So yellow is yes, tan is think about it, purple is pull it. So there's another another one that uses blue, yellow, blue, and green. Um, and it's the same concept. Yellow is good. So you want yellow. Blue is bad. But these color metric devices, they're low tech. They're less expensive. They're less sophisticated. Um, but you know they don't cost a couple thousand dollars uh, like an entitled uh, system does. So it's a low-tech way to do it. Uh, it works, uh, but pref the preferred gold standard is to use entitled. What they don't show you in the text here um, is uh, attaching an entitled CO2 monitor to a uh, non-breathing patient. There will be a secondary um, or supplemental PowerPoint for you guys it kind of shows a little bit more about that and then kind of looks at a couple of the different waves. Not that this is something that I'm going to expect most of you guys to, to master what each different type of wave looks like and does and what it really means, but it gives you a, an exposure. Um, and uh, as this may become something that you're using in your practice, you, of course, will want to take uh, more training on this, but uh, it'll get you an exposure. So. Who's useful to use this on? Like I said, people who are respiratory complaints, critically ill patients, and then confirming 
um, tube placement. We use it as paramedics. We use it as a confirmation that our endotracheal tube is actually in the lungs, not in the esophagus. So. Moving on to blood glucose or glucometry. Um, glucose, obviously, is a, an essential source of energy. Um, we have to have glucose, water, and sugar in order for our metabolism to continue. So it's one of the key three elements. Um, very little glucose can enter the cells without the help of insulin. So when I talked about the diabetic ketoacidosis patient, um, I said these people have high blood sugars. And most people are like, I don't understand that. If they have high blood sugar, why is this a problem? Well, the problem is the insulin. The problem with diabetes is not sugar. The problem with diabetes is insulin. So insulin is a hormone that our pancreas creates. And insulin is used, number one, to get the sugar in from the bloodstream into the cell and then once it's in the cell, it actually becomes a catalyst and helps it be broken down and, and become usable. So you can have all kinds of sugar running around in your body. Um, and uh, just I'll, I'll kind of uh, skip ahead a bit here. Uh, normal blood sugar is roughly 70 to 110 or 80 to 120, depending on the lab uh, and the values uh, for your local area. But it's roughly somewhere in there. So you may have a person with a blood sugar of 1,000. So 10 times norm, and they're still altered mental status, they're grouchy, they're whatever. And uh, in those cases, if you're dealing with this, um, they've got all the sugar they need. They just don't have the insulin to help get it in. So the brain cells do not require insulin to use glucose. So they tend to function a little better, but they're still going to have some altered mental status because the rest of the body is kind of suffering. As for all the other cells, they got to, they got to have insulin. So when the patient is a diabetic, they take their insulin, and then they didn't eat, and their blood sugar plummets. That's why they go unresponsive very, very quickly, because there is no sugar for the brain to use. So, and for that brain to function, you have to have that adequate supply of glucose. So we're going to measure glucose levels uh, in our diabetic patients. Um, Type 1 diabetics, formerly referred to as juvenile onset diabetic, uh, diabetes or diabetics, they do not produce insulin. They have to take a supplement. So they get an injection or they have a pump. Type 2 diabetics, or formerly referred to as adult onset diabetics, produce inadequate insulin or they have an, a resistance to the insulin that they do produce. So they often will take medications that will improve the efficiency of their insulin or they will help to uh, uh, reduce the resistance to that insulin. So AEMTs, we're going to obviously tra uh, treat hypoglycemia by administering either glucose or the medication called glucagon. Now when we say glucose, that's a loose term. They can they're alert and able to maintain their own airway, we may ask them to eat something. We may give them oral glucose. If they're unresponsive and unable to maintain their own airway. We might start an IV and push dextrose 50% on them. If we can't get an IV, we have no other way to give them uh, dextrose. So we would then switch to glucagon. And glucagon is a hormone that will help release some stored sugar in the body and at least make it available to the diabetic as kind of a last-ditch rescue effort. Hyperglycemic patients or hyperglycemic diabetics uh, can become very ill. Their biggest problem is dehydration because there's all this sugar floating around in the bloodstream. The body says, how am I going to get rid of it? Well, sugar isn't as close to, a, uh, isn't nearly as much of a friend to water as salt is because salt and water go everywhere together. But sugar can be uh, gotten rid of via uh, the kidneys and uh, the water is flushing it out. The body's trying to wash it out. So um, that's where you can get rid of some of the uh, sugar from. Uh, we'll throw another little interesting tidbit here at you. Uh, the type of diabetes we're talking about right now is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus. Diabetes, it translated, means to flow through, generally referring to the um, over abundance of urine that they produce. Um, so they pee a lot. Mellitus, if you, if you take uh, and uh, 
translate mellitus, it translates into honey sweet. So honey sweet to flow through. Well, guess how they used to test for diabetes? Yep, somebody had to be the king's pea tester uh, and taste it. Uh, is there sugar in it? Yep, it's sugary. Okay, well, your sugar's obviously high today. So yummy. So di dehydration is a, is a big issue for uh, diabetics, and we'll get back to that uh, when we get to that chapter. So the uh, blood glucose monitor that you're seeing here, um, we've got obviously the monitor. There's a uh, bottle or jar of uh, strips there. And if you look at in the red boxes on the strips there, the middle red box actually tells you what the, the average ranges uh, are for those that lot of strips. They also have an alcohol wipe. They have some Lancet devices there. Um, those Lancets that they use, just a, a word of caution, the blue tip on them, uh, the sharper blue tip at pointing upward, um, you do not pull that out. You twist it off. It twists off. Uh, and if you pull it, you actually pop the spring and uh, you won't get it to work. But uh, those Lancets, you, you twist uh, that tip off and then it'll come right out. You ditch that in the trash. And then uh, it is a spring-loaded lance on the inside. So you put it up against the finger or whatever else you're going to lance press the blue button on the bottom there, um, and it will shoot spring-loaded, uh, shoot the needle out, poke the finger, and then with, retract the, the needle so you don't get poked with it. So the other thing that you need here is you need uh, usually a gauze square, because you're going to want a gauze square to, number one, wipe the first drop of blood away uh, because it's contaminated, and then number two, uh, to help control the bleeding afterwards, and you may want a Band-Aid as well. So to look at this a little closer, um, blood glucose levels, uh, we check those in most of our diabetic patients, uh, especially when signs or symptoms suggest hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. I don't like the way that they state all diabetic patients. Um, we have to, You are smart enough to think about this. We're not going to check a blood glucose on everybody. If the patient is alert and oriented and complain of ankle pain, there's absolutely no reason to check a blood sugar unless for some reason their altered mental status caused them to trip and fall and hurt themselves. There's no need to check a blood glucose on everybody. It's just absolutely not necessary. Um, the insurance companies and Medicare do not let doctors run every single test in the book to all patients because, oh, well, that, that will help us figure it out right now. Um, that's asinine. That's, that's just stupid to even go that route because you need to have a suspicion or a hunch in order to justify even doing it. Uh, a normal blood glucose, and typically it's abbreviated BGL like that, uh, is 70 to 110, or depending on the lab, maybe 80 to 120, 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. Now, we hadn't touched on deciliters in MedMath. This is, in, in certain diagnostics, is the only time you're going to see deciliters um, in medicine at least in pre-hospital medicine. Deciliter means a tenth of a liter. Remember centiliter, a centiliter would be a hundredth of a liter, and a milliliter is a thousandth of a milliliter. So in a tenth of a liter, not ten liters, a tenth, so, um, So a, ten, a tenth of a liter, you're going to have 70 to 110 milligrams of glucose in that. So we're not talking about a very large amount. Um, we'll say, um, well, a standard pop can is about 350, 375 milliliters. So less than a third of a standard pop can is what we're kind of talking. Um, is is a So 100 milliliters uh, would be a deciliter. All right, blood glucose level, we place a drop of blood on a test strip that's in a device that will then analyze it and give us a digital readout. Um, that's really the very basic description of how this thing works. So how are we going to do it? Uh, you pre prepare your device. So get the device out, you got your gloves on, you probably are going to check it if you have to do a check on it. Uh, depends on the, on the monitor, you need to know it. You should read, anytime you have a new piece of uh, equipment like this, you should read the owner's manual and figure out how it really is supposed to work. 
because each manufacturer is a little different. So you get it out, you get it ready, get your test strip out, get your lancet out, your alcohol wipe, your gauze pad. Cleanse the skin uh, with alcohol uh, prep or an alcohol wipe and allow it to dry before doing the finger stick. Getting alcohol into uh, uh, mixed into blood can screw it up a little bit. Now, she is rubbing on the side of the finger off to the side of the callus, and that is where you should make your puncture. The pad itself that you, if you put your hands flat down on a surface, say to put your hand palm down on a table, um, any surface that's touching the table is, is calloused. It's thicker. So that's why we go off to the side of it. I mean, that's where we do all our work. Um, we go off to the side of it, puncture there, and we're usually able to get blood easier there than punching right through the middle of the finger pad. So scrub it with the alcohol wipe. Take your lancet. Take off any safety cap that there may be. And you can see that they're puncturing off to the side of the pad. So they're going to puncture that. Wipe away the first drop of blood that appears because that any contamination that stayed on the surface of the skin or was on the, uh, the needle itself could potentially be in that blood drop and could, be, uh, could cause some uh, inconsistencies. So you wipe away that first one and then milk the finger for a second uh, drop of blood. You get that second drop of blood and depending on the strip, this one, uh, you actually touch it to the side. Most of them you either touch it to the side or the very tip end. Um, the older ones, you maybe dropped it actually on the top of the uh, strip itself. So and then you can do this by holding the uh, strip to the finger and usually the blood will just draw right up into the uh, strip itself. Usually it takes anywhere from 10 to 60 seconds uh, for the device to read. Newer ones are quicker, older ones are slower, um, and uh, it will give you a reading on the, uh, the meter. And then just double check your uh, puncture site, your Lancet site, to make sure that uh, the bleeding is controlled and if necessary, obviously you gave them, you, most of the time the patient's alert enough we can after we punctured and gathered our drop of blood, we can take that gauze pad, put it on their finger, and say, here, hold this here, and they can do it for us. Um, and if, if all's good, you can slap a little uh, Band-Aid on there and uh, call it good. Another word of caution when it comes to your uh, monitor, monitors can be switched to read in a different mode. It's called millimoles, M-M-O-L. Um, and usually it will say right on there whether it's measuring in millimoles or um, deciliters. So be cautious if you get some really odd number that you didn't expect. Double check to see what it says next to that number. It'll either say DL or MMOL. Uh, and you want the DL. So another reason why you should read your book, uh, your owner's manual, because if it gets switched, you're going to need how to switch back. All right. And then finally, cardiac monitoring. I want to talk about cardiac monitoring. So there's a portable cardiac monitor, uh, defibrillator. Uh, this is an advanced one, does 12 lead EKGs, does defibrillation pacing. Uh, I'm guessing this one probably also does end tidal CO2. So this is a fairly uh, uh, advanced monitor, uh, common that many paramedics would have this type of monitor. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, electrocardiogram, uh, an ECG. It can also be abbreviated EKG. Um, I, I prefer ECG because there's no K in electrocardiogram. But, um, so the electrical activity of the heart is then traced by this electrocardiogram. Um, it uses the electrodes that are placed on the skin, and they detect a very minute amount of electricity from the cardiac impulses. When it detects it, it displays the representation of a wave of positive and negative flows um, between the different electrodes. Um, so anything that is flowing towards the hot electrode goes up. Anything that flows away from the hot electrode or to the, the ground out, uh, it's actually not ground, to the negative electrode um, is going downward. So as we look at this waveform here, um, you're, I don't expect you guys to memorize this, but it's good to, to have as a piece of uh, information. You can see that there is a P wave, Q wave, an R wave, an S wave, a T wave. We have PR interval, a QRS interval, an ST segment, 
and the isoelectric line. So everything that goes up above the isoelectric line, the P wave, the R wave, the ST wave, or the T wave, I guess, um, is positive. So if this is in lead two, presuming it is, this is in lead two, when you place the wires on a patient's chest, this is flowing towards the red wire. Anything that's going down, such as the Q and the S waves, uh, that is actually flowing backwards towards the white wire or the white lead. So um, if you've never put one of these on, uh, the wires, the limb leads that we, we use, uh, we put the white one to the right, so the white on the right shoulder, uh, or technically it should be the right arm. The black uh, smoke is over fire, so the black one is the left arm or shoulder, and then the red one is the left leg. Um, if there's a fourth one, it's usually green, and the green goes on the right leg, and so they'll say clouds over grass. And then um, um, you may also have chest leads. Uh, you may have a fifth one uh, that would go right in the center of the chest, and it's usually brown. So. Um, you're going to need to know what piece of equipment you have. Now those wires are also marked, so I will have a, uh, a little cheat sheet eventually for you guys that uh, when we get together uh, we can, uh, you guys can have to uh, help you remember this. Uh, it's a, uh, I got a little, a bunch of little laminated cards that will help you out. So. All right, so cardiac monitoring, these waveforms of the ECG show the amount and direction of electricity. Sometimes electricity moves not, uh, not toward or not away. It actually moves at a 90-degree angle or perpendicular to our leads. In those cases, it looks flat. So um, now just because there is a flat line doesn't mean that there's nothing, uh, that, that everything's going sideways. It's possible that nothing is going on. So, um, graph paper moves to the EKG machine. So you can look uh, at page uh, 473. Uh, there's a representation of the graph paper there. Uh, and it shows you that each little box on that graph paper uh, moves at 0 0.04 boxes. Or that, that's the representation of, of four hundredths of a second. And then one heavy box, or four of the littler boxes, uh, represent a fifth of a second, or 0.2, 0 0.2 of a second. So uh, that's the graph paper moving. And uh, the stylus is just constantly mapping what it's seeing. And it's, most of the time, it's pretty close to real time. It's, there's a very, very slight uh, lag time to it. Uh, normal sinus rhythm, or NSR. Uh, I prefer RSR, regular sinus rhythm. I feel it's better descriptor. But uh, when the heart rate uh, and measurement are all within normal limits, then we're called normal sinus. The sinus is an area of the heart in which a uh, pacemaker, the normal pacemaker of the heart resides. It has nothing to do with the sinuses on your face. Briefly, uh, to uh, consider the cardiac uh, monitoring. If you would like to, this is actually on page 474 in your text, but if you would like to flip back to 473 and look at that top graph there with the PQRST on it, the P wave is the electricity moving through the atria. So as everything gets dispatched from the what's called SA node and distributed throughout the atria, that's the P wave. The PR interval or P2R interval is the length of time it takes for the electricity to start at the SA node, travel throughout the atria, and then a, a reconvene at the AV node, or the atrioventricular node, which is down towards kind of the uh, um, septum between the uh, atria and the ventricles, as well as the right and left sides. The QRS is the movement of electricity through the ventricles. So when the ventricles uh, are contracting, um, that's when they have the uh, um, large spike on there, that QRS, large spike. And then you have a T wave, 
and the T wave is the flow of electricity as the ventricles resume their electrical charge. So it's kind of a reset. So P wave is the atria firing, QRS, ventricles firing. T wave is when everything's resetting. Actually, it's when the ventricles are resetting, but that's what we think of it as. The QRS interval, it has to, it should travel very quickly through there, so you see that QRS interval, um, and uh, that's another thing that we look at. Some of these various segments and intervals we look at and we're concerned with, uh, with specific cardiac conditions, not something we're going to dwell on here. So we'll practice applying the, uh, uh, the cardiac monitor when we get together for uh, skills day, and uh, Appropriately, uh, the leads should be on, if they're listed as a limb lead, R-A-L-A-L-L or R-L should be put specifically on those limbs, the arms or the legs. We cheat, and most of healthcare does, cheats, and puts them somewhere on the chest or the trunk because it's just easier. But appropriately and correctly, they are placed on the limbs. The chest leads are, there's very specific landmarks that we look for for chest leads that we're not going to go into here. It's uh, easier to uh, demonstrate. Um, and then uh, also I have a card for you to, like I said, uh, take a look to help remind you of that. Um, so if you're going to do EKG monitoring, you obviously have to explain it to your patient what's going on. Set the monitor usually to lead two. Um, attach the, the, the leads and the electrodes. The other thing that's very, very key and important when you're applying an EKG is skin prep. So you need to rough up the skin, you need to clean out the oils, usually with alcohol, and if there's a lot of hair, you need to shave it. So we'll talk more and practice that more um, when we're face-to-face. -face. So in summary, pulse oximetry measures the degree in which the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Capnometry measures the amount of exhaled carbon dioxide and that tells us a lot about their perfusion and ventilation. Blood glucose uh, measures uh, in diabetics and patients with altered mental status, uh, measures just what their sugar level is at. And EKG monitoring can provide basically real-time information about the electrical function of the heart. Uh, we're going to analyze all that information obtained from the various different sources and use it to help us make some diagnostic choices in our patients. And that wraps up this chapter.